It is a particular privilege for us to be gathered here today to honor a civilizational partnership between the two oldest civilizations of history. Our specific subject today is Indology, and I have often wondered when Indology precisely began. It would not be too far-fetched to say that Indology must have existed before Alexander's invasion. After all, Alexander came in search of something that he must have heard about. He must have come, and he did come, in search of a knowledge that he had heard about. So inquiry into our nation and into our civilization preceded the oldest known invasion of our country. Indology represents the fascination of the world for India and its civilization. And this fascination is one of the great narrative histories of our common heritage. I can list only a few of the known sources or known scholars that have come in. And it is particularly pleasing as well as rational to say that China has contributed traditionally to the subject of Indology, perhaps more than anyone else, starting from Fa Hien, famous 405 to 411 agency, which is very early in the fifth century. Song Yun, very early in the sixth century. Yun Sang, very early in the seventh century. Yi Sing, late in the seventh century. So you can see a consistency. It is not a one-off experience. It is not a maverick arrival of an individual. It is a continuous search for something that India had to offer. This continues into the second millennium, the first, first uh, I mean, extent, fully extent. I will not say great, because there must have been scholarship before that. But the first fully extent uh, sociological study of India is uh, Al-Baruni's Tariq al-Hind. Al-Baruni comes along with Mahmud of Ghazni. In the same entourage, one person is coming to loot. One person is coming in search of savagery. But along with him is a scholar coming in search of knowledge. Travelers, Ibn Battuta, the Portuguese were one of the great Indologists of their time. The great Indologists of their time. Uh, their scholarship and their experience of the Mughal days remains a very primary source. So what were they in search of? They were not in search of trade. Trade with India had existed with all the recorded history. Those of you who are familiar with the history of Rome I must have read Livy. Livy reports that in the Roman bazaar, in the Roman markets, there is an Indian bazaar. And this Indian bazaar, he writes, is draining so much gold from Rome's treasury which is now being exported to buy Indian silk, that he's worried about the impact on Rome's economy. So it, but it is not simply trade. What the world was seeking was something that we had to offer. India was the philosophy capital of the world. And India was a knowledge hub of the world. And this is really which was the basis of the scholar's search for India. Philosophy, knowledge, and all the variety of implications that these two very simple words convey. It is well known, the inner Rishi tradition, the definition of knowledge was the search for something different, the search for something new. The search for something new is a very interesting concept. Because it automatically means that I am looking for something that I do not know. It requires humility to accept that. The search for somebody else's knowledge is the search for difference. This search for difference leads to a mindset 
where you begin to accept the difference. And when you accept the difference, you accept the difference in all its dimensions, whether the difference of attitudes, habits, and also differences of religion. And within this search for the difference lies something that is the most powerful part of our contemporary India, which is the plurality of our nation state and the plurality of our civilization. So welcome, sir. It is a great honor, Professor, to welcome you here and to honor you. By honoring you, we honor both our civilizations. And it is a particularly great honor that this award is being given to you by a scholar who is sitting in our midst, who is also our president. Thank you. We now have the presentation of the Distinguished Indologist Award 2016 by the President of India to Professor Yu Long Yu. In compliance with the Honorable President of India's announcement, the Indian Council of Cultural Relations instituted the annual ICCR Distinguished Indologist Award in 2015 to recognize eminent Indologists working abroad who have made outstanding contribution to the study, teaching, and research in India's philosophy, thought, history, art, culture, etc. The winner of this year's Distinguished Indologist Award, Professor Yu Long Yu, is Professor and Director at the Center of Indian Studies, Shenzhen University. He has studied Indology for half a century and is the pioneer for Indology in South China. He has translated Indian novels, dramas, and folk literature of more than 300,000 Chinese characters and published more than 80 academic articles in domestic and overseas periodicals and media. He's the author of several books, including Indian classic works and Chinese classics, Indian writers and Chinese culture, and a history of Sino-Indian literary exchange. He has set up the Center for Indian Studies in Shenzhen University that has been the representative research institute on Indology. He also set up the Tan Yushan Sino-Indian Friendship Museum in Shenzhen University. For his invaluable contribution to the study, teaching, research in India's philosophy, thought, history, art, culture, Indian languages, literature, civilization, and society, may I now request the President of India, Mr. Pranab Mukherjee, to confer on Professor Yu Long Yu the Distinguished Indologist Award for 2016. The award of a gold label pin includes 20,000 US dollars and a citation. Professor Yu Long Yu. May I request Professor Yu Long Yu to please say a few words in acceptance. Bharat ke mananiya rashtpati, adarniya shri Pranam Mukherjee ji, Bharatiya Sanskritik Samand Parishat Ke Adhyaksh, Maniya Shri Lokesh Chandra Ji, Videsh Rajya Mantri Maniya M.J. Akhwar Ji, Vishist Atithi Gaan. 2015年11月, Yindu Vengwa Guanxi Weiyuan Hui, ICCR, Zai Sindeli Zongtong Fu, Juhing Longzong De Sijie Yindu Shujia Da Hui, Mukti Zongtong, Jiang Jichu Yindu Shujia Jiang, नवंबर 2015 में भारतीय संस्कृति संबंध परिषद (ICCR) ने राष्ट्रपति भवन परिसर में विश्व भारतवित सम्मेलन का भव्य उद्घाटन किया था। माननीय राष्ट्रपति श्री प्रणब मुखर्जी जी ने विशिष्ट भारतवित सम्मान का ताज जर्मन विद्वान प्रोफेसर स्टाइटन करोन के साथ रखा था। आज ही चिंतियाँ आज माननीय राष्ट्रपति श्री परम मुखर्जी जी इस भव्य राष्ट्रपति भवन के परिसर से उसी सर्वोच्च सम्मान से मुझे सम्मानित कर रहे हैं 
，一九六五年夏天，还是一名中国上海农村青年的我，在语文老师的鼓励下，报考了北京大学。入学以后，每个人可以选择三个专业，也许是神明的支持安排，我选择了英地语专业。英地语专业选择了我。我是巴菲特，格林·里图曼，上海的一个农民，学语言教育，学习语言教育，学习语言教育，学习语言教育，学习语言教育，学习语言教育，学习语言教育，学习语言教育，学习语言教育，学习语言教育，学习语言教育，学习语言教育，学习语言教育，学习语言教育，学习语言教育，学习语言教育，学习语言教育，学习语言君为轻，我将它改造成为了自己的座右铭：成事为重，名次之，利为轻。我用半个世纪的时间，将印度语言文化的研究从专业变成了职业，从职业变成了终身的事业。प्राचीन चीनी चीनी मनीषी दार्शनिक मेंशियस ने कहा है, जनता सर्वोच्च होती है, उसके बाद देवतागण और अंत में शासक. मैंने इसमें कुछ परिवर्तन करके कुछ इस तरह से इसे अपना अपना सिद्धांत बनाया है कार्य संपन्न होना सी सर्वोच्च है उसके बाद मान मर्यादा और अंत में लाभ इन पांच दशकों में मैंने हिंदी भाषा और सांस्कृतिक अध्ययन को अपना पेशा बनाया है और इसी पेशे को अपने जीवन का उद्देश्य भी一切成绩无论大小，都离不开环境、天时、地利和人和的支持。对我今天取得杰出印度学家奖，我认为这份荣誉属于我的母校北京大学，属于我的师尊季羡林先生。我在那里求学任教十九年，是北京大学给了我智慧与力量。तथ्यों ने यह प्रमाणित कर दिया है कि ऊपर वर्णित सिद्धांत मेरे लिए अत्यंत प्रभावी सिद्ध हुआ है जाहिर है सारी उपलब्धियाँ चाहे छोटी हों या बड़ी समयानुकूल ही होती हैं और परिस्थितियों से अलग नहीं रह सकती विशिष्ट भारत में सम्मान जो आज मुझे मिला है मेरा ये मानना है कि इस सम्मान का पात्र मेरी अलमा मैट पिकिंग विश्वविद्यालय और मेरे पूज्य गुरु जी श्री चीशियान लिन जी हैं मैंने वहाँ अध्ययन किया है और 19 वर्षों तक वहाँ शिक्षक के तौर पर हिंदी पढ़ाई है इसलिए मेरी बुद्धि और शक्ति दोनों ही पिकिंग विश्वविद्यालय की देन है这份荣誉属于我服务了三十多年的深圳大学，它给了我平台和机会。我在深圳大学创建了中国南方第一个印度研究中心，并且培养了一批优秀学生。इस सम्मान का पात्र शंचन विश्वविद्यालय भी है जहां मैंने पिछले तीस वर्षों से से सेवारत हूं शंचन विश्वविद्यालय ने मुझे मंच और साथ में मौका भी दिया मुझे प्रसन्नता है कि दक्षिण चीन में पहले भारतीय अनुसंधान केंद्र खोलने का सौभाग्य इस विश्वविद्यालय ने मुझे दिया और आज तक के विश्वविद्यालय कई उत्कृष्ट छात्रों को प्रशिक्षित कर चुका है属于中国、印度和世界各国的印度学家，我的成绩是在他们的学术基础之上研究获得的。चीन और भारत के साथ साथ इस सम्मान के पात्र तमाम विश्व के भारतविद भी हैं, जिनके अध्ययन की बुनियाद ही मेरी सफलता का कारण है。今天陪同我来领奖的是我的女儿玉秀，她是一位作家，十六岁时。他的长篇小说《花季雨季》在中国家喻户晓。我希望他能够了解、热爱印度，将来在他的笔下出现印度的形象和故事。आज ये पुरस्कार स्वीकार करने में अपनी बेटी युशु के साथ आया हूँ। वह एक लेखिका है। 16 वर्ष की आयु में ही उसने फूलों का मौसम, बारिश का मौसम नामक उपन्यास लिख डाला था, जिसकी चर्चा चीन के घर घर में हुई। मेरी ये इच्छा रही है कि वह भारत को समझे और भविष्य में अपने लेखन में भारत की छवि और यहाँ की कहानियों को उजागर करें।
，今天世界正在迎接一个前所未有的新时代，而中国和印度正处于前所未有的历史发展时期。印度学研究比任何时候更加重要，更加富有意义。आज विश्व एक अभूतपूर्व नए युग में प्रवेश करने जा रहा है ऐसे में चीन और भारत एक अभूतपूर्व ऐतिहासिक विकास की दहलीज पर खड़े हैं भारतीय अध्ययन पहले से कहीं और अधिक महत्वपूर्ण और सार्थक बन गया है ग्यारह से तेरह नवंबर 2016 तक शंचन विश्वविद्यालय में आयोजित द्वितीय विश्व भारत विश्व सम्मेलन का सफल आयोजन इस तथ्य को पूरी तरह से प्रमाणित करता है। अंत में मैं चाहूंगा कि मैं अपना सम्मान स्वीकृति भाषण चीन और भारत एक क्षितिज में गूंज चुके नारे से समाप्त करूं चीनी हिंदी भाई भाई चीनी हिंदी भाई भाई धन्यवाद धन्यवाद शुक्रिया इट्स इंडीड ए प्रिविलेज फॉर मी टू बी प्रेजेंट एम इट्स यू ऑन दिस हैप्पी ऑकेशन एंड टू हैव द अपॉर्चुनिटी टू एक्सटेंड ए वॉम वेलकम to all the distinguished guests assembled here. The eminent Indologists present here have devoted their faculties to the exploration and propagation of the Indian knowledge system. I thank all of you for your invaluable contributions which have Promote it and spread Indology around the world. I am indeed happy to have conferred the second Distinguished Indology Indologist Award 2016 on eminent Professor Yu Longwu of the People's Republic of China. He has been selected. By the learned jury, for his significant contribution to Indology as a researcher, teacher, and academician, he is foremost epigrapher on the history of the Indian religions. His work has added substance to Indological studies, and will go a long way in inspiring. Future efforts in this direction. I commend the jury for their selection, and I congratulate Professor Yu Longu. I have no doubt that his work and contribution to Indological studies will be an inspiration to many others in his country. And beyond, <clears throat> distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's not surprising that the second distinguished Indologist Award being conferred on a scholar from China, a civilization with which India has had. Age-old academic and cultural exchanges. The contacts between our scholars, scientists, and historians date back to ancient times. These mutually inspiring relationships were further reinforced by the impelling ties of religion, trade, and cultural affinities. The infusion of geographical and mythological elements 
of India into the Chinese literature and art bear testimony to the rich cross-pollination of ideas between our civilization and the vibrant cultural and economic linkages that have continuously flourished between our two people. Writings and colorful descriptions contributed by Chinese historians are an invaluable component of India's recorded history. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, in every aspect, India represents a balance between tradition and modernity. We find our history and heritage reflected in almost all our transactions from the mundane level of everyday customs and ritual to our academic work in science, innovation, and mathematics, and also our spiritual pursuits, creativity, and cultural activities. Our villages are firmly rooted in our traditions but have simultaneously leapfrogged into the cyberspace. Yoga and Ayurvedic medicine are examples of ancient Indian science that still have an important influence in our daily practices. They continue to be popular and are being actively revived and promoted. Indian civilization has always been open to new streams of thought and information. This diversity is at the core of our pluralistic society. The wealth of our multifaceted experiences has made Indology past in its scope. Our unique heritage has made it exemplary, rewarding for scholars to explore it in the framework of India's vibrant tradition, its history, languages, culture, and religions. It is important to recognize that Indology is a relatively modern and developing academic discipline. We owe its progress and popularity to the 18th century pioneers like William Jones, when he established to study Indology an eminent organization like Asiatic Society in Calcutta in 1784. Henry Thomas, Cote Brook, and August William Selgit. In the 19th century organizations like Asiatic Society, American Oriental Study, German Oriental Society, Japanese Association of India, and Buddhist Studies, to name a few, played important role in its revolution. I take this opportunity to once again pay tributes to their path-breaking work. The Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the contribution of the foreign scholars to the development of Indology has been critical. Their efforts have led to the worldwide awareness of India's rich cultural and civilizational past. Indology has helped to understand the development of human civilization, from religion and philosophy to science and social science, language, grammar, aesthetics, ancient India had theories and answers about the whole range of complexities 
of human life. These are some of the reasons why I felt that a special effort to promote Indology needed to be made. I am glad to note that ICCR has not only instituted this award, but also coordinated with counterparts in their country, in other countries, to take this initiative further. I congratulate them. I take this opportunity to also commend the leadership of Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi, External Affairs Ministry, Minister Srimuthi Shushma Swaraj, and his level assistant deputy, Sri M. J. Agbo, for their efforts and numerous initiatives for the promotion of Indological studies, both in India and abroad. Particularly, the UN resolution on yoga at the initiative of our Prime Minister is a landmark step towards that. I am confident that their endeavors will be fruitful and will enhance interest in Indian studies in all parts of the world. With these words, I once again congratulate Professor Yu Longu of the People's Republic of China. I also offer my best wishes to the success of the Second Indologist Conference being hosted in the Republic of China this year. I wish that conference all success. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, thank you, Professor Long, for your coming and accepting the second Indologist Award. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It was on Chinese initiative that the long pilgrimage of Sanskrit Buddhism began in her thought, literature, and visual expression. It was a reflux of two cultures with a personality of its own. The Buddhist monastic ideal created a new form of social organization in which the rigid class form boundaries were effaced. Brilliant monks came to the mainstream from all walks of life. Palace culture of Confucianism was invigorated by the new people's culture of Buddhism. Buddhist shramanas and sutras came on horses when the first sanctum in China is the White Horse Monastery. Chinese polity saw it as power and virtue, as shakti and bhakti. Like the great Kumara Jiva, Professor Yu has trained a whole new generation to comprehend modern India besides translating Chinese classics into Hindi. The thrust of Indian and Chinese philosophies has been an effort to uncover the deep motivations to provide a morphology of society that is in consonance with ever-evolving imperatives. Confucius has said, where education takes root, no class distinctions would exist. To sum up the unique personality of Professor Yu, I may cite the words of Mencius. He is perfectly void of four things. He has no selfishness, no prejudice, no bigotry, no egotism. <coughs> Professor Yu replenishes the great flow of values between our countries, where the mind is but a shaft from the supernal. He reminds me of the graceful bodhisattva of compassion, one you or Avalokiteshvara, with a lotus in his hands, watching the world. Compassion makes the world as twilight makes a day. China is the only country with a deep commitment to her heritage, to her language, to her classical Confucian ideals, and to the rhymes of the deeper universes of Buddhism. Professor Yu symbolizes this light that has cradled our cultures to gild the blanks of our technosphere. 
We have assembled here to honor a Chinese scholar who seeks to create beauty, unity, and harmony in subtle and simple words to harmonize two great cultures and civilization. China is the only country where the Chinese emperors ate and drank in vessels which are sanctified by Sanskrit mantras. <coughs> One such utensil was sold by the Christies in a London auction in London for 200,000 British pounds. I worked on this. There are about 100 such utensils belonging to the emperors of China in the National Palace Museum in Taipei and another 50 around in the National Palace Museum in Beijing. So the Sanskrit tradition is as much a part of the Chinese heritage as it is of India. China has started the process of cultural valorization to replenish and enrich the mind. Professor Yu sprinkles milk from the depth of time in many colors of meaning. His Herculean efforts seek a renaissance of various centers, placing a princely kiss on the sleeping beauty of multiple identities. In consonance with his land, he involves the fire of roots and the magnetic power of performance of his Sino-Indian heritage. China's Indology is the most ancient, going back to 2 BC, when she sent an imperial envoy to the Sanskrit-centric UHE court to learn Sanskrit. All glory to Professor Yu and his Indologic colleagues who seek a polychrome sharing of cultures. May I end with the words of the Thang poet Li Shang Yin. I, who was given in a dream the brush of many colors, wish to write on petals a message to the clouds of the morning. Friends, we are <coughs> grateful to our venerable president of India for gracing this occasion and honoring a great scholar who has dedicated his life to our land. At the same time, may I also thank our Minister of State, Dr. Akbar, for having found time in spite of his busy schedule in the parliament and to give us a message that Indology is not just a creation of the West, but something that goes deeper in our international relations. We are also grateful to Professor Yu Log Yu and his daughter for coming over from a distant land. They have been pilgrims over centuries, so I think he is one of the modern pilgrims. And ladies and gentlemen, once again, many, many thanks for your presence to endow your, with your, uh, to grace this occasion, to honor a great tradition and a great nation which have shared for many centuries, not only culture, but also civilization, technology, the Indian astronomers were uh, heading the Chinese astronomical board for two centuries, and their descendants to this day are called Fan. Fan in Chinese means a Brahmin. So our relations are extremely fundamental, and the relations are extend not only over time, but to the deepest elements of life. Thank you once again.